It's January 1st, 1980, in the Paris suburb of boulogne billancourt As the body of an 83-year-old man had ceased to function properly leading to his death, medical personnel had come to pick up the empty vessel belonging to someone who was once a recognizable and celebrated footballer in France. There are so many cases of guys who at one time or another were famous only to die in relative anonymity. Their names and accomplishments barely remembered, if at all, by anybody today. This is one of those cases. But why pick this one as a subject for a podcast? Well, first off, we wanted to have the first episode be a relatively short story, but at the same time, it needed to be interesting. And this one is pretty unique, too, within the history of the game. Picture the scene. It's May 15th, 1928 in the small coastal town in northern France called boulogne sur mer Well, and let me preface this by saying that this takes place in France, and obviously there's going to be a lot of French names. I don't speak French, but I'll try my hardest to pronounce these names the best I can, just out of respect. But also I'd like to apologize in advance for any French-speaking person out there who might uh, cringe upon hearing my, my French. Anyway. It's late at night, and a group of friends are out drinking. They're having a good time. The bar that they're currently in has had its last call, so they decide to walk out and head to another one where they could get a few more shots in and call it a night. So, your typical bar hopping scenario. This has probably been happening for thousands of years, ever since the first towns came about and uh, the first bars or pubs were established. A group of people go out at night, they drink, They leave, they go to a different place, and they drink some more. That's common, common scenario. So they step out, and it's dark, but they don't care. They know where they're going. When they finally reach their destination, they have to wait for the door to open. So these guys start singing. Again, very common, right? People drinking, they're out, they're having a good time, start singing. Nothing out of the ordinary with this scenario. But then, one of them stops suddenly reaches into the pocket of his jacket, pulls out a gun, and without uttering a single word, fires multiple shots at another one of the men. The victim stumbles into another establishment, where he's able to get some aid, but now the shooter is nowhere to be found. As you can probably already tell, this is in your average football or soccer podcast. If you happen to have a short attention span, this probably isn't for you. It takes a certain type of mentality, a certain type of intellect to enjoy this kind of material. So if you are one of these special individuals who enjoy amazing stories of legends, myths, with madness, drama, tragedy, and badassery, then welcome home. This is Round History. It's entertainment, a little bit educational, a little bit instructional, instructional, instructional. Now let's back up a bit. The man this episode is about is Pierre Victor Moni, born in Paris on March 23rd, 1896. But without much information regarding his childhood and upbringing, we're going to have to jump ahead to 1920. This was when he was 24 years old, already a World War I veteran, and had just begun his, air quotes, career in football. He was playing for US Boulogne, which was a club in the north of France, and he had likely joined them in a previous year along with his brother. They both quickly earned the respect of opponents as well as local sports chroniclers throughout the region. It didn't take long for them to be called up to represent the French national team, 
And that would happen in a friendly against Italy in Milan on January 17th of 1920. These were the early days in French football. They weren't yet considered a world power, so expectations were pretty low. So even within France, reading some of the match previews, there's an understanding that they were the clear underdogs, and instead of hoping to get a result, they were just hoping to not get crushed. So for example, La Vie Sportive du Nord wrote, quote, Let us hope that our defeat, alas, isn't too stinging. The Moni brothers, who are very fast, will have to support a line of halves they have never seen and cover a goalkeeper they know even less of. But they can, however, play a leading role against the very fast Italian attack, end quote. As if being underdogs wasn't enough of a challenge for France, the team also happened to arrive in Milan just an hour before kickoff. This was after an extremely long train ride to Italy. So how do you think the match unfolded? Well, the newspaper Louvre reports that in the first half, the teams were actually pretty even. But then fatigue affected the French players in the second half, and that's when it all went downhill. The final result was a 9-4 humbling by the more experienced and fresher Italians. The defensive unit made up of the Moni brothers and the goalkeeper were kicked around quite a bit by a good number of the French press. Granted, the Parisian press didn't think that football in northern France was on the same level as that of Paris and the south of France, and much of that criticism was coming from the Parisian outlets. By the way, the defensive unit mentioned here, made up of the goalkeeper and the Moni brothers, were really it as far as formation goes. Back in those days, pretty much every team was playing a 2-3-5 formation. And it would be the case for quite a while. Certainly in this episode, we won't see any difference, so keep that in mind. Moni returned to Boulogne and continued to perform at a level that was impressive enough to warrant a presence in the French squad that was taken to the Summer Olympic Games in Antwerp, Belgium. At the Olympics, the French team managed to get revenge against the Italians in the quarterfinal. Uh, they won 3-1, but if they felt like they were flying into the semifinals, then they were swatted back down to earth real quick by Czechoslovakia. But despite losing 4-1, they had no reason to really hang their heads low. The Czechoslovakian team was one of the great teams of that era. Muni never got a chance to play, but being part of the team that showed some promise in the Olympics could only help his image. And at some point, before the end of 1921, he would transfer to CASG Paris. The full name of the club is Club Athletique des Sports Généreux, which really makes me appreciate initials. Anyway, CASG had recently won the French Cup in 1919, and in those years, the French Cup was the highest level of national competition that they had in France, so it wasn't unlike winning the league. Monier would go on to help them lift the 1922 Paris Cup trophy after beating US Suisse by 3-2 in the final. Again, clubs from the Paris region were thought to represent the highest level in France along with those from the south, so within that context, the Paris Cup was seen as a very prestigious trophy. Monier was turning out to be a very good player, but he would go on to play for France only four more times, and for whatever reason, each of those with less than desirable results. They lost every single match he played in, so under heavy criticism, he would never be called up again after 1923. The following year, in 24, he married a young socialite by the name of Paula, and eventually they had a daughter together. He stuck around playing in Paris a while longer than having become a respected footballer and getting up there in age, but with a little bit more in the gas tank left to offer, he would return to the club where it all began for him, US Boulogne. Back in Boulogne, he would help them win the Northern Championship in 1926. This helped solidify him as a local hero. This would have elevated his status. If we were to look at him from a marketing perspective like we do in today's age, he had a few things going for him. By all accounts, and even looking at pictures of him, you can tell that he wasn't an ugly guy. Certainly when looking at squad pictures, compared to the teammates, he was actually really good looking. 
Then given his history in the Great War, where he had started in the 12th Regiment of Dragoons to end as a corporal in the Air Force. And the thing is, based on the research we did for this, there's a good chance he took part in the Battle of the Somme, if not Verdun as well. These are two of the most horrific battles known to mankind, certainly in recent memory. If he was in even one of those and came out alive. I mean, think about that. From a French perspective, these battles happened in their own backyard, and he was there to defend them. Now, of course, he wasn't the only one that was in those battles, so you take all of those factors into account, and you can see why he had become sort of a star, at least in the northern region, if not all over France. Having become fairly accomplished, it seemed like he was beginning to transition into the process of retirement. Sources say that his parents gave him a restaurant or a cafe to run in downtown Boulogne-sur-Mer, but it's also possible that the restaurant was part of an agreement to return to U.S. Boulogne. Since we're talking about the amateur era, providing players with business establishments to run on the side were one of the, shall we say, more creative ways that club presidents or chairmen found as a way to compensate some of these players, since they couldn't pay them directly. Often these chairmen owned their own businesses, so selling an establishment to a person who just happened to play for the club you preside over wasn't exactly the club paying them directly for their services. I mean, and it's not like people didn't know that this was happening, but on paper, it was okay. So the official story is that his parents bought him that business. And again, that could well be the case, but I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if that was just a front. In any case, he ran a cafe together with his wife. His popularity in the region must have been great for business. One customer in particular ended up becoming a regular and eventually became close friends with the Moniz. His name was Jean Delpierre. This was a man who was once a famous sportsman himself, having competed as a cyclist and even as a Grand Prix driver. Now, for those who don't know, cycling back then was a very big deal. And along with rugby, it was a notch above football in the hearts and minds of the French people. When it comes to Grand Prix motor racing, this was a precursor to Formula One. So just as a side note, in the test preceding the 1913 French Grand Prix at Amiens, one of Peugeot's drivers, a Paul Zuccarelli, crashed into a hay cart and died on the spot. So who stepped up to replace him for the race? Jean Delpierre. Granted, he abandoned the race in the first lap, but the stones it would take to fill in for the dead guy can't go unnoticed. Sure, we can't compare it to Pierre Mouny's war experience, but I guess my point is that these weren't your average human beings, at least by today's standards. So now retired from competition, Jean Delpierre was an agent of sorts. There's not a lot of detail as far as his profession went, but some sources say he was an importer of goods. And this sounds made up. Maybe he worked for Art Vandelay. That was a joke and a reference. And if you got it, you got it. If you don't, you're going to have to look up Art Vandelay. In any case... As part of his occupation, he had to travel quite a bit, and when he was home, it would appear that he liked to spend a significant amount of time hanging out at the cafe with the Moniz and other friends that he had. It seemed like for Moniz, he was all set to retire and play a little bit longer than right into the sunset. He had a side business ready, and he would just transition to that, and that business had a celebrity as a regular that celebrity in Jean Delpierre because he was also famous. But that's basically the Facebook slash Instagram version of Pierre Moniz's life. On the surface, it seemed, like, it seemed like everything was great. Everything was awesome. But in reality, Moni and Paula, his wife, were having marital problems and she would end up moving out of their house. She took their daughter along and was now living with her parents in Calais, not exactly far away, but it was away from his home. This was devastating to Pierre Moni, which brings us back to the start of the episode, the night of May 15th, 1928. That evening, after Moni closed his cafe, 
As he was ready to take off, his friend Maurice Dagbert noticed Monny could use a little pick-me-up. Dagbert convinced him to head over to a bar and meet with his friend, Jean Delpierre, for some drinks. When they arrived at the bar, they found the cheerful Delpierre along with some other friends. Monny quietly joined them. It's a couple of hours later that the trio would leave and head over to the other bar. Delpierre and Dagbert were the ones singing the song, and Monny was the one who pulled the trigger on Delpierre. He hit him on the head, chest, some sources say stomach, left thigh, and left arm. The severely injured Delpierre was able to stagger into an establishment close by, and he was bandaged up and taken to a hospital. Monny took off towards the port. He threw his gun in the ocean and then drove to Calais to see his daughter, to give her a kiss, probably realizing the magnitude of his mistake here. He then went back to Boulogne and turned himself in. Two days later, on May 17th, at 5 p.m., Jean Delpierre would die from his wounds. The authorities were never able to get his version of the events. As Monny is told of Delpierre's death, he offers his, his most heartfelt sorrow. Fast forward a few months, and it's October 2nd, 1928. We're now in a small commune of Saint-Omer, also in northern France. This small but comfortable courtroom, as it was described, that had still not recovered from the Great War ten years earlier, is packed with sportsmen of northern France. It is said that the nervous masks of the northern sportsmen were prevalent in the audience. Many of them Moni's old teammates, and there were also many curious citizens around. All parties arrive and ready themselves for the proceedings. The local journalists have to share spots with those who traveled a long way from Paris. This is an ordinary case, circumstances that happen often enough. In fact, the previous trial, that very same day, in that exact same courtroom, was a situation not unlike this, the only difference being the subjects involved. And in this case, they were quote-unquote celebrities. A lot of people were wondering what he would look like after spending four months in jail. And as he walks into the courtroom, their curiosity is finally satisfied. He was said to have looked a lot thinner and a bit older, but then descriptions start to diverge a little bit, or a lot. One source goes on to say that, quote, He has a look of terror in his face. As he sits down, he closes his eyes as though dizzy. Then he opens them and looks straight ahead as if he can't see anything, quote. Another source, Le Petit Journal, gets a little more dramatic about it. They say, quote, What a presence! His eyebrows arch well under the slightly low forehead. He has a powerful nose and a strong jaw. By the way, from the pictures, you can tell that he definitely had a beak on him. So when they say powerful nose, it's likely a nice way to say that he had a big nose. And they continue their description with a physiognomy that reveals less intelligence than will, even stubbornness. Again, this description. How do you interpret that? It sounds like a backhanded compliment, doesn't it? And then they finish with, His chest, molded in a purple jacket, cut to an exact fit, dominates from above the defendant's box. On the jacket's lapel, three shiny ribbons, a military medal, a war cross, and a foreign decoration of light green color. Quote. So here he is displaying his military medals. One could definitely make the case, as cynical as it sounds, that it was a strategic move to remind everyone that he put his own life on the line for them. Another newspaper, Le Petit Parisien, is more on the positive side, saying, quote, He wears a modest attire. One could say they're mourning clothes. The humble restraint he adopts does not hide his athletic strength, particularly those classic shoulders of a football defender. And they finish with, A beautiful man, his 32 years of age, displayed in full force. End quote. Pierre's wife, Paula, is also there. Sources describe her as a young and thin, petite blonde woman who walked with her nose up in the air. She was a popular socialite and caused a sensation with the outfit she was wearing. Paula had on a monkey fur coat and 
held a lizard skin bag under her arms. I mean, it's safe to say that she was lucky Peter wasn't around. Anyway, the sensation was because there was a certain amount of expectation as to how she would look and handle the situation. And she was a popular woman within the area's elite circle of women. As the trial begins, and Moni is grilled by the judge, one of the questions asked was, why is it that he had a gun in the first place? Well, he replies to the judge that he always carries it with him after he closes up the restaurant. So this line of questioning was due to Moni being charged with premeditated murder. This is based on the fact that he confessed to taking a loaded gun to the bar that night. If convicted of murder, the French penal code of the time would have him sentenced to death, meaning he could be facing the guillotine. And I don't mean the choke. They go through some more questioning, and then more details begin to surface. We start to get a better picture of what was going on. So it turns out that Paulo was about to divorce him. To make matters worse, he suspected that one of his best friends, Jean Delpierre, was having an affair with her. And just a little caveat here. The quotes we're reading from had to be translated directly from newspaper articles of the time, so they may not be 100% the way a native speaker would prefer to translate, but they get the point across. In any case, I'd like to apologize once again to any French speaker that might stumble upon this and think that, you know, uh, that's not how we speak. But going back. So the judge asks, quote, This Delpierre was a pillar of your establishment. He was a customer to keep, was he not? Quote, Delpierre would spend such a significant amount of time and money at Moni's establishment that his business seemed to be what kept the lights on at the cafe. Moni, in response, agrees that he was a regular, but that's the extent of it. Then as the line of questioning continues, based on eyewitness accounts, things get a little uncomfortable for the defendant. The judge then follows with, quote, Your establishment was mostly attended by a group of young people. They were very free with your wife. They would talk to her, and she would engage with them. They would kiss sometimes. Quote, According to a source, Moni seemed embarrassed at this moment, and who can blame him? The source also states that, quote, Whatever he may have said, it seemed that he had tolerated a rather strange proximity between his wife and Del Pierre's friends. Quote. Pierre Moni replies to the judge, saying, quote, Unfortunately, yes, I was shocked, but when I brought this up with my wife, she told me, What do you want? I knew them before you. It doesn't matter. End quote. So the court established that Jean Delpierre would hang out with many of his friends at the cafe. Apparently, he and Paula knew each other prior to her meeting Moni, and they might have had more than a friendly relationship. That's unclear. At a certain point, the judge asks the ladies to exit the proceedings because the details may offend their sensitive ears. All but one actually ended up leaving, so they continued. According to witnesses, they also established that Moni endured things like Paula requesting that Del Pierre would show his legs to guests. He, as in Moni, tried to deny such things happening, but failed to convince those present. Things then escalated to the point where Del Pierre would bring gifts for Paula, then further to the point where they would start going on trips together. Meanwhile, one of the guys who would hang out at the cafe came up with a nickname for Paula, that nickname being Manon, as in the opera by Jules Massenet. In this opera, Manon, she's the main character and has a bunch of suitors. However, she ends up falling in love with a simpler or more humble origins guy, but eventually she leaves him for another man who promised her a life of luxury. Well, Sources don't say how well off Del Pierre was, but he seemed to travel often and had some money to spend. Paula, being a socialite who liked to dress in the latest fashions, would have enjoyed a life of luxury. So now you can see how the nickname was originated. The judge blames Moniz's tolerance and lack of attitude for things getting out of control with his wife. When the judge brings up their escapades, detailing how Del Pierre and Paula had gone away together, to the outskirts surrounding boulogne sur mer and even as far south as Nice, then the courtroom erupted in laughter, while Moni, clearly feeling the humiliation, was on the verge of crying. 
Moni then reveals that the tragedy took place sometime after his wife had decided to divorce him and that he was very depressed. Then, in an exchange with the judge, he explains that what happened was not premeditated. So the judge says, quote, That fatal night, you had taken your revolver and you wanted an explanation from Del Pierre. You stated it yourself. You then entered the bar where Del Pierre and several of your friends were. They sang, but you sang too, quote. Moni then replies with, quote, I was with Mr. Dagbert. I took my revolver as usual when I go out at night. I found Del Pierre at the bar with his group. I sang. I sang yellow because I felt that I was taunted. Quote. Now when he says he sang yellow, he's meaning that he was seething inside but was trying to hide the fact that he was angry. And if you remember, they started singing outside the bar and that's when he pulled the trigger. Now, what song could they have been singing that would make him so angry? Well, that song was from the opera Manon. And what it said was, when I close my eyes, I see. That means he knew of the nickname and he knew of the song. And they sang it in front of him. Now let that sink in for a bit. Try to imagine a situation like that. It's hard to imagine a sober person keeping it together in a scenario like that. And then you add alcohol. Yeah, you're asking for something bad to happen. And according to Moni, it was at that point that things happened at lightning speed. He rationalizes by saying, quote, They confirmed my suspicions by making fun of me. They had turned my misery into mockery. That's when I saw red. I saw red and I shot. End quote. At this point, we can make an assumption that he was presenting his case as the equivalent of a crime of passion, which if he could convince the jury of this, would change the punishment he received. Now check this. Article 324 of the French Penal Code of 1810, which was still being used up until 1994, states that, quote, In the case of adultery, murder committed upon the wife as well as upon her accomplice at the moment when the husband shall have caught them in effect in the house where the husband and wife dwell is excusable. Quote. So in other words, if you caught your wife or husband cheating in the act and kill them right there and then, you're good. Yikes. Muni's case is different, but if he was to convince them of a crime of passion, then it's expected that he would receive a punishment way more lenient than death. As Paula steps up to speak, some sources say she was tearful, others describe her as being, quote, infuriated, irritated, bitter, and speaking with a shaky voice, Mrs. Muni took aim at all those who she said wanted to dirty her name, quote. Then they continue, quote, then in a charge against Moni, she accuses her husband of being complacent as well as having repugnant vices. She said he lived at the expense of her parents. Mrs. Moni then opens up about how she would be beaten not only by Pierre Moni, but also his parents. End quote. Moni tries to explain himself by saying, quote, She only got a pair of slaps and that's it. Quote. <sighs> well... That doesn't make it any better, does it? Paula Moni eventually does admit to having an affair after her initial denials, but she makes it clear that Moni was doing the same. The way she put it was that she left him free to do as he wanted, and he let her free as well. And by the way, basically all articles come across as biased against Paula. You get the sense that they're blaming her for the whole ordeal, which is completely unfair, based on their own findings. Now, was it simply because she was a woman? It's hard to say, but it's entirely possible. Continuing, after Mrs. Muni testified, her mother also came forth against her son-in-law. Then a couple of more witnesses were on the side of Pierre Muni, and they detailed Mrs. Muni's involvements with Del Pierre. Lastly, a Mr. Le Corps de Corlan, a lawyer at the Court of Appeal, a former airman and former squadron leader of Pierre Moni defended him, telling them how good of a soldier he was. His testimony left Moni in tears. In the end, Moni's defense argued that he had always been a good person, from a good schoolboy to when he became a good soldier after enrolling voluntarily, first serving as a cavalryman, then as a pilot. 
They drive the point home by stating Pierre Moni twice answered the call of duty, and in all the jobs he had held since the war, built a reputation as an excellent workman. It's an interesting situation because on one hand, he was a decorated World War I veteran, former French international who played in front of thousands of people. When you think of the pressure this guy had been under throughout his life, you would think that he could handle anything life would throw at him. Or maybe, considering what he went through in World War I, the trauma of it all, he never really recovered, and it was just a matter of time until he snapped. What happened here could have simply been the match that lit the powder keg. Whatever the case, whenever it comes to the human psyche, it's never simple, is it? The thing is, they didn't even understand the effects of war on the human mind back then, so that was out of the question, at least as far as making a case. Not that it's an excuse at all, people commit the same crime without having been to war. In any case, going back, could his fame as a former French international, his military service history, and standing as a French war hero help garner enough sympathy for him? And what would it be? Murder and a death sentence? Or a crime of passion and some prison time? Well, after the prosecution and defense lawyers gave their closing arguments, the verdict was finally announced. Pierre Victor Moni was acquitted of all charges. Although Moni became known as the footballer who got away with murder, he would never play again and went on to spend the rest of his life in obscurity until his death on the first day of 1980. Thank you very much for listening. If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe. It only gets better from here and just know that there's a lot more where this came from. I can't wait to hear from you as well, so drop a note and uh, say hello. Until next time, this was Round History.